Hey, Ellen, can you hear me okay? Wait a minute. <clears throat> hey, Christina, how are you? I'm okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you very well. Beautiful. Welcome. We have, uh, there are 50, about 50 people registered for the webinar. And, okay, cool. Uh, a bunch of panelists and only the panelists will be showing up uh, on video okay so we're gonna wait uh, we saw two minutes till eight I think we'll probably wait till about five after to begin okay for those participants who have signed in early welcome and we are going to uh, get underway as soon as we have our full complement of panelists with us okay uh, if <clears throat> hey Rebecca, hi Lisa. If people wish to introduce themselves and uh, maybe say what school you're from for the other registrants, that'd be great. Hey, Shira, welcome. How you doing? Hi, Shira. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Good, how are you? We're okay. <laughs> You're good. I hear it. We're very busy. Oh, great. How's it going with everybody else? <laughs> it's a busy life. Yeah. So, uh, sure. I just explained to Christina there are uh, 50 uh, union members from Rochester from the New Rural Caucus registered wow. for this webinar. Yes. And um, in addition to you and Christina, we're waiting for Jillian. And here comes Jillian. Yay! 
Yay from Los Angeles, Arlene, uh, uh, Mary, and Barbara from Massachusetts. Uh, and who am I missing? Maybe that's it. Maybe Arlene, Mary, and Barbara. And um, we're up to, it looks like, 23 participants, and they are introducing themselves in the in the chat section by their school. These are these are all teachers in Rochester, members of the Rochester Teachers Association. And um, sure, I'm sorry we lost you just then. Oh, am I here now? Yeah, you're good. Jillian, how about you? Are you with us? Yes. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Are you able to join with video or would you prefer not to? Shortly. Okay, we'll wait for you. Uh, up, both Mary and Jimmy and Barbara Madaloni say they're both going to be a little bit late. So we will not wait for them. And let's give Arlene in a way uh, a moment or two more and then we can end also waiting for the rest of the participants to show up. Are they going to see us on bit? They're going to see us, right? They are, but Great. we are not going to see them. <laughs> yes, I understand. I've yeah. never actually been a. Done I've a webinar, never been on this side of a Zoom call. Oh, okay. Yeah, the the webinar structure is just a little bit different than a regular a regular Zoom call. Oh, Arlene says she's coming on. Very good. Hey, Jillian, how are you? Ah, finishing dinner or maybe breakfast. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Hey, Arlene. Hey, sorry for the nope. delay. No problem. No problem. Um, I think because we expect this to be um, a, a, a long and serious discussion, and also because we know that um, some people may have to leave exactly uh, an hour from now, um, we're going to get going. Uh, Rochester teachers, ROAR members, hi. It's wonderful to see you all on. There are currently 31 attendees. Um, um, I'm sorry, uh, let's see, it's 27 attendees who are on the call. Uh, you unfortunately are not able to see one another. We are not able to see you. The only visual on a webinar are the people that are acting as panelists. Um, there are uh, 50 people registered, so we expect people will be joining. Um, two of our panelists have sent me messages saying that they're going to be a little bit late, but we're going to get underway. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I hope it goes without saying, and those of you who have now met and begun to work within Rochester, I think you know the esteem with which I hold my sisters uh, who are appearing on this panel tonight. Um, you will have heard from me already many times in our short acquaintanceship um, that I consider that the cutting edge work being done by teacher unionists around the country who have formed caucuses, who have uh, established programs, uh, radical programs for union democracy, uh, for progressive uh, <clears throat> issue positions, both inside their union, inside their school districts and their communities, who have done the hard, tedious, non-glamorous, uh, challenging work of building caucuses inside unions, which often have been moribund, which have been static spaces, um, uh, is considered by many, many people in this country to be the most important work going on in our labor movement today. So it's a 
tremendous honor always for me to be together with uh, outstanding activists in the system and to bring them to you. Um, briefly, Mary, welcome. Nice Thank to see you. Hi. Hi. Just, just beginning to uh, introduce uh, the group that we are speaking to. So uh, WAR, the Rochester Organization of Rank and File Educators, is a very young caucus. It is two or three weeks old. Um, it was formed, as I think you know, in response to a cataclysmic imposition of austerity measures. They have been growing, as they have in every district in this country, slowly and steadily over some decades. But right before the Christmas holiday, the superintendent announced a $67 million shortfall that was going to necessitate the immediate laying off of and displacement of hundreds of educators midterm. Um, um, a small group of teachers got themselves together, began talking, found their way to us. Um, we began having meetings together. They threw up a web page that went in membership from 200 to 1,200 in a matter of days. Um, they've been uh, strategizing, moving positions, mapping their buildings, uh, building out very, very quickly to try and respond both in the short term to this crisis and in the long term to um, reforming, democratizing, and powering their union ahead. I will mention, some of you may be aware of this, but their president, Adam Urbanski, is perhaps one of the longest serving presidents in the NEA world. He's been in office for 38 years. Uh, this was, <coughs> I did not greet the appearance of this caucus uh, with a lot of excitement, as you can imagine, but they are. Um, Pleased to say that the Roar members are negotiating that relationship with a lot of um, maturity and reflection. Um, and we'll be meeting actually with him uh, at the end of this week. Uh, with that introduction, um, what I'm going to do is just quickly introduce the people that we have here. And then I'm kind of going to move this ahead by asking specific questions of people uh, on the panel. Um, those of you who are uh, registered, uh, who, are, who are listening, there is a Q&A uh, button on the bottom of your screen. You can write questions in there and we will handle as many of those as we possibly can. Um, so who we have on the call? Um, we have Mary Najimi, who is the current president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. Uh, she was the president of a local uh, in Concord, Mass, a founding member of the Caucus of Massachusetts Educators for Democratic Union. Arlene, in a way, is the current secretary of the United Teachers of Los Angeles. She was the chief negotiator uh, during their historic strike uh, last year. Uh, Jillian Russell is the co-chair of the caucus uh, in UTLA, which is called Union Power, uh, a, a longtime, incredibly dedicated uh, activist committed to both rank and file and community-based organizing. Uh, Shira Cohen is from the Caucus of Working Educators in Philadelphia. She is a candidate uh, for office. They have a full slate from their caucus running for office. Um, I think we will get to hear about that. Their campaign is just looking spectacular. And Christina Duncan Evans, we are so unbelievably proud and excited about what the uh, Be More, the Baltimore, movement of rank and file educators has done. They swept their elections uh, this last year, this last spring. Uh, on the teacher side, um, they, did, they also have a, a, a full slate of paraeducator, uh, professional support personnel uh, positions, which they did not take and are doing a great deal of work now as they move into running uh, the Baltimore Teachers Union uh, doing a lot of work paying attention uh, to that sector of their membership. And we have just been joined by Barbara Mattaloni, who is the, uh, also a founding member of Educators for Democratic Union in Massachusetts and the former president of the Mass Teachers Association. Sisters, welcome and thank you for taking this time. Um, I I'm gonna start, Jillian, I'm gonna start with a question to you. Uh, could you just define for us what you think a caucus is. What is a caucus? Hey everyone. Um, so 
a caucus is a group of members within the union that share a vision um, for where the union should go. Um, and so that is and organized to move their union in that direction. And so um, for all of us, we experienced what that was like, you know, before we ran a slate for election. Um, I don't know how much you want me to go into time-wise, but, and, um, and when we built enough momentum and capacity and the moment was there to be able to uh, run, to lead the union in that um, new direction, um, we've done that as well. So, I mean, there are a variety of caucuses. Um, a lot of unions don't have necessarily real active caucuses, but um, uh, so it's just a group of union members who share a vision for where that union should go um, and organize on that basis. Great, thank you. Uh, Christina, could I put you on the spot to uh, try and explain to people what motivated uh, educators in the Baltimore Teachers Union uh, to form a caucus? What were some of the concerns that you had about your union that made you want to change it? <clears throat> and why was a caucus the right thing to do? Um, sure. So I think that um, we started our caucus around 2015, 2016. And at that point, politically, we were seeing um, a lot of race to the top play out in ways that um, were uh, disingenuous, hurting teachers, um, and we felt that our union um, was a, wasn't really appropriately responding to those issues. Um, I remember being in a room in like 2015 with our union president when she learned that the park tests were given on computers, um, which was something that like the educators in the room had known for some time and like were quite concerned about because we didn't have a lot of computers. Um, certainly not enough to like give the level of standardized testing that was needed. And we um, weren't happy with um, the level of organizing that was coming out of the union. Um, and so we, um, and, and in some ways we felt um, really frustrated by a contract that was initially sold to us as like self-paced earnings, um, but in a lot of ways just kind of kept moving the goalposts further and further away um, in terms of like raising teacher salaries. Um, and we wanted a bigger, stronger voice um, against our, our district. We wanted more democracy internally because it felt like the union ran like a club instead of like a democracy. Um, and we wanted uh, our union to take a stronger stance on a lot of things uh, that were affecting our students like police brutality, like immigration issues. Um, we wanted a more active union that was touching our lives in more significant ways. That's great, thank you. So um, I think Christina, in your answer, you identified what, what uh, I often uh, think about in describing this kind of three-legged stool of caucuses, which is um, they want to address social issues, both in, in the classroom, inside the union, and inside their districts. Um, they want to address the issue of um, uh, member inclusion and empowerment, and they want to address issues of union democracy. Uh, so I think I'm actually going to turn to Murray and ask you, Murray, uh, what were some of the concerns about union democracy in the MTA that made sort of EDU uh, eager to get itself organized? Go you ahead. Mean Lack of union democracy, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> the negative of union democracy. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I'm listening to Christina, and it's almost the same story. It was, uh, you know, mid 
2000s and the president of the MTA what had his own neoliberal, he bought into the neoliberal agenda. Um, it was all about making concessions and compromising. We used to hear the story, we can't fight because we can't win. We can't even get our members to send postcards. Well, the postcards that the MTA was asking us to send was a, a compromised vision and version of education. So um, very specifically, it was around the time of Race to the Top. Um, the body, I had agitated with a small, this was pre-caucus days, I had been agitating with presidents. Um, our statewide president was in negotiations with the governor around Race to the Top, and we passed a new business item at annual meeting that said, you can't accept a deal if it's going to tie test scores to teacher evaluations. And we actually knew that's what it was all about. So we figured we had killed it. It was voted on almost unanimously. He comes out of negotiations. He couldn't uh, change that dynamic of test scores to teacher evaluation. So he asked the board to accept race to the top. He completely undermined the will of the body. And that was it. So we started organizing and then came, um, he began capitulating with uh, and for children around get, getting rid of our seniority rights. And he was, respons he was responsible for weakening our collective bargaining rights around health insurance. So we were just fed up uh, and we started organizing Building the Caucus and a couple of years later it turned into Running Barbara. Um, and Barbara came and you know, the caucus put her into office and collectively what Barbara brought was the analysis of, you know, neoliberalism and helped it connect it to people's experiences. And then we started hearing when we fight, we win. Um, <laughs> and now five, five and a half years later, that is the common phrase, not only in the caucus, but across every MTA local where there's really good fights going on, be they EDU uh, locals or EDU, locals that have EDU members or not. It's really changed the context in Massachusetts. Mary, thank you. And it's an important point uh, to raise and to remind us, and I know we've had this discussion in Rochester a number of times in the last couple of weeks, that the goal of a caucus is to transform the union. It's not to start a new union. It is certainly not anti-union, as you will be accused of. You're not splitting the union. You're trying to transform and liberate the powers that have been like squandered by the union, in some cases, for decades. And Murray's point is well taken. Sometimes it will be caucus members uh, moving a resolution, moving an issue, moving a campaign, or getting elected to office. But it is also about changing the culture of the union. And Shira, I wonder if you could pick up there because the WE Caucus in Philly has done a wonderful, wonderful job about addressing kind of culture transformation issues and take it wherever you want, but I certainly hope that at some point you will address the way in which the WE Caucus uh, became uh, the center of uh, helping educators to begin to, to work on an anti-racist program not merely a racial justice program, but anti-racist. Please go ahead. Yeah, yes. So is the question, can you say the question again, just so I'm clear? How'd you help, how did the WE Caucus help to change the what culture? you think of as the culture inside yes. the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers? Absolutely. So hi, everybody. Thank you all for, it's funny to not see all of your faces, but I know mm -hmm. you're all there. Um, <laughs> So I, um, I've been a teacher in Philly for 10 years. Um, I've been a member of the union for a little bit less than that. And the PFT is a service model, top down business union through and through. Um, and it's, I feel like the way that I've really been describing it to people recently um, is that it's really founded on the premise that uh, a union is run by a few people for everybody else. Um, it's a union that meets people's individual needs. And if it doesn't meet your needs, then you're probably doing something wrong or you just have to deal with it. That's kind of the, 
that's the spirit of our union. And so the caucus of working educators was founded on the premise that we are a union of many and not a few. Um, that collective work is how we win. Um, that organizing is really the only way that we're going to get what our kids need and what we need and what our schools need and what our cities need. Um, and that transformation is deeply possible. And that the only way that we're going to do that is by practicing what we say the union needs to be. We need to be the union. Um, and so I think what I'll do is name three ways that we've done this. I'll talk about the anti-racism piece. I'll talk about our contract negotiations piece. And I'll talk about our petition that we did last year about healthy schools. Um, so in terms of the anti-racism work, the caucus um, has a racial justice committee. Um, it has been in existence since 2015. Um, obviously, our PFT never had a racial justice committee of any kind. Um, the PFT pays a lot of lip service to racial justice, but in terms of actually getting anything done, it's incredibly limited. And what the racial justice committee has done over the last five years is has brought educators into uh, of not just talking about race and not just talking about race in our schools and our own racism and our own biases, but really bring that spirit to their classrooms and their buildings. And it's really interesting um, because what we're seeing with educators and schools has really taken off is that coworkers are following, people are having um, conversations and groups in their schools about uh, ending racism and what it looks like to be an anti-racist educator. Um, we had uh, an organizing, basically an organizing training um, that was written by members of the Racial Justice Committee um, last year, where we've had trainings for people on how to bring that work to their schools. Um, and I think the, the culture shift is what people see is that if we don't do that work, nobody is going to do it for us. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really think that it has pushed the PFT leadership right now to take on an anti-racist program. They've definitely paid increased lip service to the Black Lives Matter movement and to ending racism in our schools, et cetera. Um, so the culture shift is it's coming from below. It's coming from our members. And mm -hmm. I think the most important piece there is that people see that unions can take this on. It doesn't have to be um, one person in a building. It doesn't have to be a person or a few people working alone. They can be backed by the union. I think that's, um, that's a piece there. And we're seeing uh, the Black Lives Matter Week of Action, um, which is now, I think, entering its fourth year, um, has grown exponentially every year. Um, and more union locals have taken it on every year since it started. Um, the and way I think that we've brought a culture shift to our union is around toxic school conditions. Um, we have mold, asbestos, lead, rodent infestations in probably 80 to 90 percent of our buildings in Philly. And the way that our leadership takes that on is by saying that they're going to ask for more money from the state and starting coalitions with politicians and talking about a lot of things on the internet and telling people that they're getting the work done. And uh, I think that what we've shown uh, in our work is that the only way that we're going to get more money is by showing that people, everyone's asking for more money, not five people at the top of the union, not a coalition of elected officials. While we love elected, many elected officials, they're not going to get the work done for us altogether. But we have to show that everybody is fighting for that. And a building conditions petition that almost a quarter of our union membership signed. And when we presented it to city council and the school district, suddenly $15 million more came to us to fix building conditions issues. And then we had a huge win this fall um, around the tax abatements in Philly, where big property owners and developers don't have to pay taxes on their land for 10 years. And if we end that tax abatement, we could bring in $150 million more to our schools. And city council voted to shift the so it's not completely gone, but it has um, it has shifted a little bit where people have to pay taxes earlier, um, and that's bringing 150 million more dollars to our buildings. And that was all because of the on the ground organizing. And so people are thinking, really starting to see that it's not going to be a few people who get this done. It's going to be everybody talking to each other. When city council sees 3,000 petition signatures on a petition, they see voters. They see um, educators who are willing to fight mm -hmm. back and they see people who are not scared. And that's not 
need a union operating in a way that is going to move people to action and move people to do a thing, even if it's one action of putting their name on a petition. Um, I think a last way that we've shifted uh, the culture of our union is one thing that the PFT has taken on, which is really exciting. Last year, we had UTLA members, including Jillian, come to Philly um, for a big meeting of 120 people. And we had people start to write our own contract language. Um, so basically bringing the spirit of, you know, we don't want a few people negotiating for us. We want everybody to be a part of negotiations. So we started doing that in April and our union leadership, lo and behold, had six giant contract meetings in September and October because negotiations have started where 80, 90 people, which is a very big meeting for us in a union of 13,000, um, 80 to 90 people came to six meetings where people made proposals and made suggestions and our union leadership wrote them down and said that they're going to bring them to negotiations when they start. And that I can and say with absolute certainty is that they saw working educators and rank and file doing that in April. And they were like, oh, what a, you know, we should really start doing that too. What a great idea. And so I think that that's a, an example of where our leadership saw what working educators is doing. Cause you know, 90 people is so much more powerful, could be a lot better, but it's so much more powerful than six people writing up some proposals in the room. So those are three ways. Sarah, that's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to go from there to this question and we're going to, we're going to move around over a number of topics, um, and, uh, certainly invite anybody who is uh, participating in the call or is listening, uh, feel free to put some questions into the Q and A box there. Um, and as they, as they occur to you and we'll take them, uh, after we finished a round of, um, these questions that I'm posing. Um, cause I want to go now to, uh, to Barbara and Barbara ask you, um, the, the things that, uh, Shira just described, uh, incredibly important moving of programs, uh, within the union, uh, when they don't have leadership, um, the WE caucus has, has run for internal union office uh, previously and, and did not, I think you got about 30%, um, uh, of the vote in previous election, is that memory serves me? Um, uh, but they have they have continued to build their membership and build their program, and they clearly are transforming the union in spite of the the leaders, uh, incumbent leaders' uh, fondest hopes of keeping it just as it was. Um, so, Barbara, the question I have for you is: What was your experience? Uh, what was EDU's experience in how you built the caucus? It started out. As Mary mentioned before, as a, I don't know if you quoted the name, Mary, but the original group was called 12 Angry Presidents. These were local presidents who were pissed off at the state president for his sellout. Um, but now it is a dominant caucus that has uh, at least like half of a 72 member board of directors, has a majority on the executive committee, uh, and has elected um, presidents, uh, executive officers now and over a period of about six years. So Barbara, some things that you could share about how you grow the caucus. How do you, how do you broaden the membership base? What are some of the things you did in EDU? Uh, you're on mute, Barbara. Sorry. Got it. Okay. Um, I think it's important to understand that, uh, in, uh, EDU is a statewide caucus. Uh, and so we're in a different position in terms of like we don't have one contract fight that we can organize around, but we do have statewide issues uh, that we can organize around. Um, and, and with that, we're a little bit like, what does it mean to have leadership is a little bit further away. Uh, Mary, when I was president, Mary being president, we're like another step away from the membership, which complicates it. Um, that being said, uh, you know, I think that we did it in two ways. Um, one is that when I was elected, uh, even though I had no support on the board, we didn't stop being the caucus that uh, the others have talked about, uh, that we still needed to be a caucus that was out uh, building fights and supporting the fights that 
uh, I, as president, was saying, let's go and, and take this on. So we had a big fight in 2016 uh, where there's an attempt. We have a cap on charter schools in Massachusetts. Uh, there was an attempt that actually came right at us to say, we're going to raise, we're going to lift the cap on charters in Massachusetts. Uh, it was a, a direct attack very much coming after Massachusetts to say, if we can charterize Massachusetts, uh, we can go for the whole country. Um, and because we had leadership um, and because we had boots on the ground in EDU and like a, a committed platform that understood privatization, that understood uh, that it mattered to build coalitions with parents and talk to the community, uh, we were able to mount a campaign that was a successful campaign. And in order to mount that campaign, we had to both fight within the board and be strategic and so that we could get the funding to win. Uh, and then we had to um, have EDU members be active leaders within their locals in pushing the campaign. Uh, and that, you know, that grew EDU in many ways. Like, like prior to that, we had been the red shirts at the annual meeting who passed resolutions. Uh, and who people would say, like, those are the smart people at the annual meeting. Who are those people in the red shirts? They have some good shit to say. Um, but we would pass resolutions, but they couldn't go anywhere because we were asking the leadership to do something, really, rather than saying, what are we going to do? And even when I was elected, because I didn't have the board with me, we at, we at least had somebody inside saying, okay, now we're going to do this and figuring out ways to put resources from MTA into the membership to move the work. Um, and then the other things that we've done was we brought labor notes in, uh, in ways that were really important. Uh, labor notes is what I work for now. For those of you on the call, uh, it's a publication and education organization dedicated to what we're doing today, uh, building democratic rank and file militant unions. And Labor Notes worked both broadly uh, to set up an open bargaining summit uh, that Mary had introduced as a resolution. Uh, and that summit uh, and every summit here after that we've had on open bargaining has completely transformed how <laughs> members, it, 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 how leadership thinks about bargaining. I mean, uh, when I was elected, uh, bargaining was something you did in secret. It was what the union president did with the superintendent and the field staff. That is, we've gone 180 degrees from that. <laughs> uh, and so we were able to use the union resources to bring people in and, and to have people see the union and, them, and be the union, a different kind of union. Um, and then EDU, like in all of that, continues to, uh, and I think maybe even more, like we started out really running really important campaigns and pushing it campaigns. We're continuing to do campaigns. We just won $1.5 billion uh, for schools in Massachusetts, but also with the help of Labor Notes, uh, going out and helping people develop and build power at the local level. Um, so that we are, we are taking on fights uh, that, and people are winning fights in their buildings and now we're getting leaders elected to their locals that are EDU. Um, I guess the thing I wanna say about that is that like, we've been really fortunate um, it, it, that we've had leadership and we've been able to address uh, both running campaigns that are statewide campaigns that, that cast a big net and bring people into the fight, even if they come into the fight because they're wearing a button uh, or they're holding a sign somewhere. And because of EDU, we've been able to build from that within that net to say, here's a way you can be a stronger union activist. So we've been lucky that we've been able to do both. Ellen, can I just add a little bit to that? Please, please go ahead, Mary. Um, back to what Barbara was saying about transforming bargaining, because EDU uh, maintained the presidency and won the vice presidency, it puts Max and I in a position where 
we can use, as Barbara was saying, the EDU resources to continue to transform the MTA in that every year that the bargaining summit is run, I have become more and more insistent that fewer of the staff run the bargaining summit <laughs> and more of the members, most of whom are EDU members, who have democratized bargaining either via open bargaining strategies or what we're now saying coordinated or coalition bargaining strategies are in charge of planning the summits um, and running the summits and what EDU activists are able to do then that just feeds right back into building the caucus is as we are all participating at MTA state level events we're building more relationships with MTA members and then many and then it's sort of creating a pipeline back to EDU so we're saying oh I heard you're interested in or I think you would be interested why don't you come to an EDU meeting um, so it's 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 beginning to create sort of this cycle of how EDU relates to MTA and MTA helps um, channel people to EDU. Hmm. Very, very helpful uh, addition, Mary. Um, and it leads me to the sort of last question in, in this round, uh, which brings us to Arlene. When you have um, uh, begun to transform the processes in the union, uh, uh, and turn from being um, a service a service union acting just like an insurance company to being a fighting organization that is actually taking on the critical issues at the heart of people's work lives, people's professional lives, and also people's lives in society. Then you end up with a an almost unstoppable force, as we saw in the UTLA strike. Uh, last year, which won tremendous, tremendous victories, both for members, uh, for students in the community. So Arlene, I'd be interested in hearing from you about what were some of the, this is like uh, for you uh, Rochester teachers out there, this is like throwing an anchor into the future. Um, when, when you decide to build a powerful union, what were some of the things that you found it was possible to do as you were building up to the strike and during the strike uh, with a transformed union, with a union that had unleashed the power of the rank and file. What difference did that make? <clears throat> okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, to start out with, just to describe a little bit of UTLA, so you know the context is that we are 35,000 members, the second largest uh, teachers union after UFT. And we have early ed, adult ed, health and human service professionals, as well as K through 12 educators as part of our bargaining union. We don't have classified, um, but we do have substitutes as well. So um, UTLA was known for a long time as being sort of dysfunctional or just individualistic or, you know, would by the whim of who was leading, the president actually was the one who was leading, uh, it would be all over the place. So um, we had to come together as a caucus. We've always had progressive uh, membership and we had a caucus for many years since before 2007. But I think what was really important is to really make sure that we put people in office in every single uh, position and to get a majority of the board. And we built it around the schools LA students deserve. So like Jillian was saying, that common vision uh, was going to be for our students. We were saying we're committed to social justice. We also said parent community engagement, involvement, alliance building is what we are going to do. So we put out a platform and um, we told our members when we were running for office is that we're changing the culture instead of the individualism. Now we want you to vote for a team. And uh, at first people didn't get it. Took a little while, but once they got it, oh my gosh, uh, they elected all of us on the first round, which had never been done in the history of the union. And, um, and we were there. And I just wanna add that, you know, 
Rochester, my heart is with you. I know it's, it's, you know, it's so tough when you experience layoffs and especially the way that it happened with you. And it's a part of what we're all dealing with is that austerity uh, budget. It's defunding disinvestment of public education over 40 years. And that finally we are saying enough is enough. And that's what we've been seeing through this movement, the educational justice movement. And um, for us, we were the fifth richest economy in the world. And yet we're at the bottom. We were 44th in, in per people spending. So that is outrageous. And we've been exposing, you know, the inequality and the corporations that who are dominating our, you know, our privatization movement. So we were exposing all that. And once we took power, uh, your question is, what were we able to do? Um, we were able to build an infrastructure based on our vision. So for example, we said, hey, we want to build parent community partnerships. We don't even have anybody organizing that or focused on that. So we hired a couple of parent community organizers. We didn't have a research department. We wanted to use data to cut right into uh, the messaging and to frame it. So we hired researchers and they also were able to give us accurate data lists of member contact information. What a radical concept, right? The actual phone number is, is correct. And we were able to give schools lists so that they were tools for organizing. We built a structure so that we have a chapter, ch instead of just a chapter chair at every school, which we didn't always succeed in, we're gonna have cat teams, chapter action teams, which we learned from. A lot of this we learned from Chicago and their 2012 strike and the organizing that they've been doing. So we built an infrastructure with staffing and um, we took bold moves and we just said, hey, uh, we're gonna fire this person <laughs> And we're going and we're going to hire organizers. And um, it was really amazing to me how when you put forth a vision and you take it to the schools, all of the officers, we have seven full time officers, we visit over 100 schools each, you take it in dialogue with members. It was astonishing to me how much everybody agreed. Uh, they want a fighting union. They even agreed to raise their own dues by uh, 30%. So we got members, once you show that vision, put it forward, have an organizing plan, uh, build the infrastructure, uh, people are with you. They want to fight. They're, <laughs> they are tired of the way it is and they're looking for leadership. Arlene, that's beautiful and, and true. We just find this over and over and over again. But it leads us to the next question, which has come up. Claire Labrosa asked a question, which Christina, I think I'm going to pose to you, if that's okay. I might pose it to several of you. Um, but yours is one of the newer caucuses represented on the call. And the question is, what obstacles were the most difficult to overcome when first starting your caucus? I think that one of the most difficult obstacles was really feeling like a caucus when you are five people who really like each other um, and you look at the scale of what you want to accomplish and it just seems like we're really going to do this by having one-on-one -on -one conversations with our colleagues and calling people and texting people and we're really going to do this through the power of building relationships <clears throat> i think that was definitely um that was definitely a challenge but it was also like um but in in a way like that was also the work that was the most rewarding i think that in baltimore there had been so much like city-wide like Mm. So that one of the things that happened is that like the nonprofit industrial complex really liked us a lot really quickly because they had been waiting for someone to disrupt the teachers union for a long time. And so we got pulled into um, we were in danger of like really being pulled into spaces oh. that were not. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> 
ultimately not very productive. Um, they didn't build the union. They didn't, those, they, we got pulled into, we, we were in danger of being pulled into fights that really weren't like fights that were central to us. That was a challenge. Um, and then I think that like one of the challenges that is really hard is just like getting critical mass. Like, I think it's a little bit similar to like the statewide challenge of getting critical mass in a local. For us, a challenge was getting critical mass within a school because there's so much bullying and retaliation that affects the school culture in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But like as a citywide caucus, it's super easy to have an impact on an issue that's district wide when like no one is showing up to a meeting and then you bring five people to a meeting and then like you run the meeting, like you can really do something citywide. It's much harder to push things in a school where everyone's really scared of getting surplus. Mm -hmm. You know, like that and and for us that what that means is like you can't teachers have due process and but you don't have a right to your school you can lose your school position really quickly if you stand up and you can get targeted really quickly to be moved to another school um, if you are, are vocal so um and then i think um i think we had like also some real difficulties like um figuring out how to do racial justice work and, and develop black leadership in a way that was authentic and not like easily co-opted. We didn't want to gentrify the union. This was uh, going back to my concern. I earlier, I mentioned that like the nonprofit industrial complex is really strong in Baltimore and the Baltimore teachers union has always been a real strong black run institution. And um, a lot of the like, like, you know, Teach for America funders were absolutely giddy at the idea of like disrupting that, but we were like, no, we need to do it our way. Mm -hmm. We can't, we don't want to do this in a way that uh, in further displaces and gentrifies like people in Baltimore. Uh, Christina, how many members have you got in the BTU? Mm, around 7,000. Okay. So I'm actually thinking, it didn't occur to me before, but I actually think that uh, Rochester and Baltimore, you had a lot to talk about mm -hmm. together. Um, I definitely recognize just from the last couple of weeks, getting to know the folks in, in Rochester, that uh, some of the issues that you've raised being pulled into fights by the <coughs> nonprofit industrial complex, um, getting distracted about your purpose too early prior to building a, a base, issues of... Uh, uh, surfacing and raising up leadership people of color without that getting uh, uh, co-opted and distorted uh, before you have any any real ability to control it. I recognize some of these things. So anyway, um, mm -hmm. I think we can talk about trying to set up a little summer joint retreat or something. It's not that far away. Yeah, it isn't. Um, so let me uh, go on and sort of uh, throw this question open uh, to any of you that wish to take it because uh, Christina raised the issue which all of you have dealt with at different times, which certainly the uh, Rochester sisters and brothers are dealing with, which is fear of retaliation. Uh, everybody is living in fear of retaliation from their management for speaking up about issues in their own schools uh, and fear of retaliation also from union leadership. So I wonder if there's anybody, maybe several of you, who would like to address the issue of what have you done and how have you been successful in helping people to uh, either overcome fear or act through their fear? Anyone want to take that? Um, I, I'll start. And Aline and then Shira, please go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit different in our context because um, but I'll share the, the how we dealt with it in building up the strike. And uh, there was fear. There were people telling us they weren't going to go out because they're single moms, they're near retirement, they're new teachers, you name it. You know, we heard every reason uh, that they're not going to be participating in the strike. So uh, what we did is we gave out a lot of information. So we clarified rumors and put that out in Q&As. But we also frame the choice a lot. And I feel like this is a really important uh, 
technique or tool is that you say, okay, so you're not going to go on strike. Uh, so then what happens? <laughs> you know, what, what do you expect from that choice? Or, you know, what are the choices and what are the results? Uh, and, you know, just helping people think through that. And then we work through, uh, we called it, we call it FUD, which is, uh, you know, a technique, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that we said the district is going to start implanting that. In, mm -hmm. in, they're going to try to scare us to not strike. Mm -hmm. They're going to make us doubt. And so whenever anything came out from the district, sure enough, they said that we couldn't talk to parents. Uh, we said, oh, you know, there we go with FUD. And we showed them a letter <laughs> from our, our lawyers, the union lawyer saying what, that we could talk to parents. <laughs> And except when we're giving instruction. So we just had to keep um, using facts, uh, using clear information to counter the things that they, to give them confidence. And after a certain amount of time, I think when you get that majority uh, people on board, the others just come on. So we had every single school site involved in our strike, 98% participation rate. That's great. Marlene, thank you. Shira, go ahead. <clears throat> um, so currently, uh, Working Educators is in our second um, election for leadership of the union. Um, as soon as we announced that we were running against our current leadership in 2015, I would actually argue before, um, we people have experienced, I feel like, every level of pushback from our own members and from our leadership. Um, we have been barred from tools. We have been barred from talking to our members. We've been barred from mailboxes. We have been barred from attending meetings. I feel like they've tried everything. <laughs> and um, a few things have worked. I think one thing is just affirming that it's happening um, and making it, like, not making it personal or like about the individual person. Um, it's an organizational problem and you have to have an organizational strategy. And if we don't address it um, with each other and if we don't have clarity with each other, then you know our leadership that's bullying us and creating a toxic organizing environment and toxic work environment is going to win. And so we talk about it a lot and we talk about um, the difference between um, you know, like responding to something, you know, depending on how you're feeling and also responding to something strategically and with clarity. And that has evolved really deeply over the last five years. Um, we've received cease and desist letters leadership telling us to stop using our logo, um, where they threatened to sue us. That's happened to a couple of other caucuses, I think, across the country. And these are all, they're all just boss tactics. They're all just tactics that management uses to come for employees and Shira uh, uh, it's interestingly enough to get clarity on our opportunity to access buildings um, and to access mailboxes where in buildings where we were previously not allowed to enter we're allowed to go in um, and that's because we just keep push like we keep pushing and we keep being super disciplined and like very clear like we are allowed to talk to people we're allowed to be here um we keep our messaging uh very positive um even though it's like very uh it's um i can't find the right word it like sometimes like we want to like online or put on our union page like this is what our leadership is doing we actually just maintain positivity and we say exactly what we need to be doing um we like keep the message positive we keep the message clear um ellen am i okay now or is it unstable it, it's so, pretty it's pretty good. unstable i think the best thing would be go on mute okay. uh, call call in keep the video open but call in and then we will okay. be able to get your voice okay uh let's see pause uh, and then i'll call in okay. very good thank you uh, Jillian was interested in uh, speaking and then Barbara in responding to this. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, I think what 
what Philly described is, is like, I, in terms of before we had leadership, um, I don't feel like we faced the same type of, it turns out that UTLA has a fairly democratic culture and openings that allowed us to do a lot of what we did without, you know, being um, shut out. But um, I, I just think like, I actually think about a lot of what Philly is doing as, as incredibly important. Um, I think the way in which they chose campaigns and very specific issues um, that spoke to just a deep feeling in the reality of teachers' lives, like the toxic schools um, or racial justice, like picking very specific things that are really obviously missing from what your union is doing, not necessarily organizing around a whole broad critique, but like picking one thing that you think people care about a lot and then doing something that's not that scary at first, like signing a petition that says, hey, we shouldn't have vermin in our schools. We shouldn't have asbestos and lead in our schools, right? Starting on that very basic level, but look at the way now I'm part of a petition of 3,000 people that goes to City Hall and gets them to do something that's very empowering, but it didn't start with something extremely risky on the part of that individual member. And um, I think that like, we've talked a lot about elections and running for leadership, but I think like, I, I wish we had, you know, in some ways I wish we had the type of timeline of what Philly has because they really built on the basis of issues and campaigns before taking leadership and they built a broad rank and file base on that and that and and i think that's what makes people feel empowered and then the other thing i would say that you know is is just the climate and using the examples of what's happened with the red state revolt i know it's kind of obvious but the fact that there is now a completely different way of doing things in teachers unions that you can point to um for us Honestly, it was the Chicago strike that created the foundation for us to say to our men, because we've been saying the same critique for a long time. We've been talking about racial injustice. We've been talking about parent organizing, but people had been so passive for so long. It was like, yeah, but you know, what can we do? But then when you have these other examples to point to um, of other cities, creating incredibly inspiring social movements around education and places like West Virginia where people are breaking the law to do it. I think that, not that that helps with day-to-day -day issues with administrators necessarily, but in terms of the legitimacy of like, hey, we really could be doing things differently in this union. Like um, it, it creates that sense of legitimacy for that type of struggle. and. Yeah, and, and it also creates a positive vision rather than just being like a neg negative critique of what our leadership's doing. So those are just some ideas. Uh, uh, we're gonna go to Barbara and then Mary, but I just wanna mention quickly that um, I'm very glad to have heard both of you and not surprised to hear you both say, caucuses should not waste their times uh, critiquing current leadership if, you, if you're not in leadership that that's, uh, that is not the way to build a caucus. You have an analysis and a critique of the model of unionism uh, that, they are, that they have imposed, uh, but no, no wasting of time trying to make them the problem. That doesn't get you anywhere. Um, Barbara and then Mary, please go ahead. Yeah. I, I I think that's a key piece uh, and certainly a key piece to EDU's success and we have to talk each other down from it a lot uh, <laughs> and say like that's not productive and let's talk about what's our vision of the union and bring people into a vision. Um, every, I really agree with everything people have said so I, I would just add um, I, in terms of overcoming fear like I think winning helps uh, and, and by that I mean like giving people entry points into the struggle where they get to experience themselves as being a part of a movement that is uh, taking, taking something on. Uh, and I think 
entry points are, I've come to understand are really, really critical. So whether it's a petition or wearing a sticker, uh, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we, um, people are excited about strikes, but they have to walk to the strike. They don't run to the strike. And are we thoughtful about how we're inviting people into the struggle and giving them opportunities to experience solidarity? And I just want to point out back to the WE Caucus again, because I just really admire the way you all have been able to move to transform your union without having power, which I know you're going to have soon in this current election. Uh, but I think, you know, um, you took on this toxic schools as a very concrete, immediate issue, and you took it on as a racial justice issue. And I think that work actually needs to be raised up that racial justice is not something that we talk about and spend a lot of time navel gazing about, even though understanding ourselves as white people is part of the work. We go out and we make concrete changes in the lives of people. And we name it as we're doing it, as this is what racism looks like. These, racism and capitalism have produced these structures and we're fighting them. And that's how we're winning this fight. And I just think, that's really important so that we don't spend our lives in abstractions about racial justice, but we're actually living to change the concrete experiences that we're all having in a world that is racist and capitalist. Barbara, thank you. It was cogent. Mary. Oh, you're on mute, Mary. I just want to add a couple more points. Um, a lot of what we, we do is we help people unpack the boss's tactics, right? So we talk about who benefits when the boss does this to us, when the boss is telling us not to do these things um, and who, who loses. Um, the other thing that's so critical is to bring people together to talk to each other so that they don't feel they're the only mm. one who's experiencing it. Mm. And there's power in knowing that I'm having the same experience as you're having. And then back to the intentional conversations, getting people to actually recognize, ask the question, so what are we gonna do about it? Because we can make change when we do it together. Um, and often when, if people don't wanna go to that point of being ready to make, take an action, make a change, we connect it back to um, our purpose. Like, we came into education for a purpose and we are not able to be the educators we intended to be and our students are not able to have the education that they deserve. And so the union is the vehicle through which we come together to fight for our own dignity and also to be able to just teach. I hear teachers all the time just say, I just wanna teach, right? And then the last thing that I want to say is we are getting to the point where the principals are so outrageous. The mm. superintendent and the principal's discipline against us is so outrageous that it's transforming people. They're just deciding it's too outrageous to even let it happen to somebody else, even if it's not happening to me. So there are these lots of little things it, it's the combination of everything that everybody has said. One or more multiple things like that is going to help people move through their fear and act despite it. Great, Mary, thank you so much. Um, there is a question that's come up in the chat uh, from Julia Lima. Uh, what role does social media have in mobilizing rank and file members? Is anybody inclined to address that? Many of us have a lot of feelings about that. <laughs> Arlene, yeah. Arlene, please go um, ahead. Sure. Yes, as we learned a lot from West Virginia uh, when we saw their actions, and then you know Kentucky and uh, and Arizona, and social media is something new for for us in terms of striking. That hadn't we haven't had that in the past. So it's definitely a tool that gets out to the masses, right? And it lets people know where things are happening, when things are happening. 
we were able to do like Facebook lives and walk people through uh, what, what was coming up, some of the issues, some of the questions. Uh, and also, you know, we have a, a, a great communications department who are putting things out, whether by email, website, uh, bla phone blast. We use all modes of communication and we even have a uh, we also voted to have a paid media campaign. So we have things on benches. We have vans with our messaging, with members, faces of members. Uh, you know, we are the, we care about our students. We dream for our students or whatever the message is. We are public schools. So all of it is important. And I just want to reinforce that it is though the one-on-one -on -one conversations. It is finding out where the barrier is, what the, the personal issues might be and to walk it through, work it through. Uh, and, and that's how I think is the most important, uh, most important communication on the school site, those kinds of combos. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of uh, recognizing myself to talk about the West Virginia experience with social media quickly, which is, as I think it, most everybody probably knows, uh, the strike there was really largely fueled by an amazing um, growth in, in membership in a Facebook page in which a decision was made quite sp almost spontaneously uh, to go on strike. Although there had been a variety of kind of build up um, smaller actions before the big strike. Uh, what's important to note though, is that after the strike ended and they did win a significant salary increase for themselves for all school support staff in the state and also for all state employees. So significant wins. However, uh, there was going to be no way to, to sustain that in a state with two very weak unions, the, the West Virginia AFT, the West Virginia NEA are both weak organizations, unless the caucus, unless a caucus was born and uh, became a stable force. Uh, it is, they made a great effort, uh, virtually, certainly everybody on this call and many, many other people in the UCOR networks uh, uh, helped to nurture and support and engage and learn from the teachers in West Virginia. They have formed the first statewide cross-union caucus. Uh, it's an NEA, NAFT caucus, and are running now for leadership in the West Virginia NEA. Those elections will be in April and they're running a slate. The point I want to make is that all the social media made them feel like they were connected to one another. And when it came to actually building out the caucus, it turned out that was very, very ephemeral. That was not substantial. And they actually had to go back into their buildings and start talking to each other. Mm -hmm. And then they had to start pulling names off of the Facebook page, people they'd never met before. And have phone conversations and set up meetings and start to have small discussions and build relationships. So I, I encourage us not to ever think that that is a substitute uh, for building our face-to-face our -face relationships. Barbara, go ahead. I'll just say EDU has a total weak ass social media presence. Like we, <laughs> we can't get anybody to update our webpage. We don't <laughs> remember to share Facebook events. It's a, it's a, it, like, and we're managing, we're managing without it. I'm not saying you should go that way. I'm just saying we're managing without it. <laughs> okay, uh, we have reached and exceeded uh, one hour. Um, and uh, oh, I see that it appears as if Jillian did have to, to leave us. We didn't get to say goodbye to her, but um, oh, I guess she signed off. Um, if anybody, I'm going to ask whether there's anybody listening from Rochester who wants to post a question, now would be the time to do it. Um, otherwise, um, I think I'm going to do a round of asking uh, the remaining the panelists to use the remaining few minutes to answer the question. Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose to you what Roar is doing. Uh, what their situation is, and see if you have some thoughts for them. Uh, they have a steering committee that they put together. Again, this is all really in the last two or three weeks uh, with about 25 people. They've got an extremely lively uh, 
thread, which as I'm speaking is just exploding. People are chatting endlessly. Uh, they have a Facebook page, as, as you know, which has 1,400 people on it, I think, and 1,400 union members. Um, they've held several uh, uh, meetings, open meetings. I did an organizing training there yesterday. They are moving a petition around the buildings by hands, which is a no cuts, no concessions petition. So reinstate all of the laid off and displaced uh, educators uh, and um, no, no concessions because of course uh, their current president has negotiated a, a, a whole succession of concessionary contracts in, in the last few decades and appears probably poised to be willing to do that again. Um, and uh, there is discussion now about, um, t and telling people uh, that they're not going to submit those petitions until they have 3,000 names out of 3,500 uh, teacher workforce. Um, and when they do and submit those petitions, presumably to the, to the school board, um, so on the way to that, generate conversations in the schools about what's our enforcement action. We're gonna present these petitions and they do this or what? So they're gonna try and uh, generate discussions about escalating tactics um, that, uh, that educators can undertake. And that's about, that's about where they are. They're also meeting with the president and I guess the executive committee at the end of our weeks, at the end of this week. Um, so curious whether anyone has um, uh, advice or thoughts or suggestions about um, how they can both address this issue of these massive layoffs uh, and also you in doing so continue to build the caucus. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Christina? Um, so I think one of my suggestions would be a little bit of an infrastructure thing. Um, and I don't know to what extent the steering committee knows each other or has worked with each other before, um, but I think one of the most helpful things um, that we did when um, we were um, starting out and very small, small enough to do this, um, was to um, have one-on-ones with the entire steering committee. Like I had, I had individual conversations and like, I think that those form the basis for the deep relationships you're going to need to count on mm. the people who are really going to like be um, like between the seven of us. I think four of us have had like hair fall out um, and I'm not being facetious. Like I had to take a break because my hair was falling out at one point and without the relationships in the core of the group, like it, it can be really, really tough to 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 power through so that's a that's something i think to do um between crises <laughs> um but i would start as soon as you can thank you christina any other thoughts please arlene yeah thank you for that christina and i i was wondering you didn't mention an action uh, I heard you talk about the petitions, but are you coming together as, you know, a whole bunch of people together in one spot? Because I think these organizing actions really invigorate and draw people, you know, you feel the power of the collective, you feel that you're fighting this together. If there was something planned to, or, you know, with the layoff notices, are you going to do some kind of physical demonstration? Uh, we, at one point in UTLA, we had chairs, empty chairs, when they did layoffs of uh, our counselors and our nurses. Uh, we laid out all these empty chairs and we put the categories of people to just make a big uh, statement that, you know, we were opposed to the layoffs and we all came together around that. Yes, Arlene, they, they are planning on, but don't, I haven't decided yet, but they definitely are. That's a, a great example. Mary, go ahead. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that we can't win alone. So who yeah. are other people who have 
an interest in what's happening. I, you know, parents, for example, depending on, um, it, it, we don't always have to start big, right? Everybody has to start with the one or two relationships that they already have. Um, are there, I don't quite understand um, the union structure in terms of uh, what's the next union that's nearby, right? Do you have multiple unions? Is this affecting the whole state or is this affecting a particular local? Um, what's happening in Massachusetts is one local is finding they can't settle their contract by themselves, so they're reaching out to the local next door and other people are showing up. So think about how do you build out your relationships with other people who care and start building out those relationships and bringing people into whatever actions like Arlene is suggesting. Very, very good. Um, I'm gonna go to the, there are a couple of questions that have showed up now from participants from Michelle. It's up here, she says, for our first meeting with union elected officials, uh, what advice would you give us to get into that in order to best get our points across the need for bottom-up unionism, knowing that this will be a threat to those that benefit from the current model. Why do you need them to understand you? <laughs> That's right, no, <laughs> Thank you. Like we went into that meeting with our former president and talked about how we believed in organizing and talked about how we believed in social justice. And they were like, yeah, us too. And we we're like, mm, I mean, it, they don't need, you don't need to understand them. I, or, or they don't need to, to like understand you. They still don't understand us. Like when they go into rooms, they, that's their comment that they just still don't understand us. Um, but you need to leave that room understanding them better. Mm. Are they hard workers? Are they smart? Are their hearts in the right places? Do they like, what are they reading? Christina, I think you said it beautifully for everybody in the call. <laughs> Thank you so much. From Mike Johnson, how quickly or subtly should we start using terms like strike, which have very strong connotations? Someone want to take that? Uh, let me just say, by the way, uh, I'm sure most of you know, but New York State has something called the Taylor Law, which makes strikes for teachers illegal and can carry hefty penalties. Uh, strikes are legal for everyone on the call, except for the Massachusetts teachers. Not except for the it's, Massachusetts it's, it's teachers. It's Massachusetts. That's what I, ju that's what I just said. Anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what I just said. It is legal for everybody except the Massachusetts. Oh, oh, I thought you had the other way around. Yeah. Um, and as I think people in Rochester know, there, there was a strike in Dedham, uh, in Dedham, Mass, that was incredibly successful, a one-day strike. It was the first strike in a number of years, and it was illegal. Uh, okay. Anybody want to take this question? How quickly or subtly should we start using terms like strike? Shira, please. Okay, hopefully this will work because I'm, I'm on it the It sounds phone. good. Sounds okay. good. So um, Philly could not strike for 20 years. Um, we recently re-earned the right, we regained the right to strike because we um, have local control now. We were under state control. We've been under state control since 2001 and it ended in 2018. And I think what um, we learned in terms of talking about strikes, the way that we would talk about it is not that we're gonna go on strike tomorrow. We just talked about it in ways that got people familiar with the idea that you can withhold your labor in, uh, as, a, as a way to get your demands met. Um, we are not ready to go on strike tomorrow. Um, and it, on this election campaign, a lot of people just see us as the strike caucus. They're like, we as the strike caucus, we're not voting for you. <laughs> and we use that as a way to talk to people about like, if we said that we were all, if the PFT leadership said we're going to go on strike tomorrow, do you actually think that people would do that? And every room, people are like, no, of course not. Why? And so then we use that as a, as a way to start talking to folks about like, well, actually, strikes are about power. And in order to have a strike, you have to build power. And that takes an incredibly long time. 
And so I think it's perfectly fine to talk about strikes. I think we have to reduce the stigma around them and we have to talk about them in a way that allows people to make them not scary and talk about examples of strikes and other places that are successful. But I think that the way you talk about it is not that we need to do one right now. It's about building enough power so that the district and the city and the state, whoever you're up against, is listening to you. Um, and it, uh, I think that that allows people to see a strike as a very deep, bold action that takes so much work to make happen as opposed to just saying, well, I'm gonna go on strike tomorrow. Um, because when people say that, it is really scary. I mean, strikes mean that you might not get paid. They mean all sorts of things that people have been hearing about from their families and from their communities. It's like a, anybody who has experienced anti-union anything hears about how strikes are bad. And um, the way that we move through that and organize through that is about talking about it, but it's about talking about it in a way that makes it something that's accessible and makes it something that we're, we only get by transformation and building. Because um, I know that if you know the PFT called for a strike tomorrow, even through all the work that we have done, we're not going out anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's good to talk about it. I think it's just about how that matters. Great, thank you, Shira. Uh, Christine Frederick asks, your advice to build uh, coalitions through relationships and positive communication is very clear. Did anyone attend a training that was really helpful or do you have a text you use as a guide in organizing your caucus? Any good guides out there? <laughs> well, how about labor <laughs> I'm looking for my book. It's like, hold on a second. I'll get it for you. Organizer. Um, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of, um, not pamphlets, but newspapers that Labor Notes is putting out about strikes, about organizing. Um, and it's, I'm so glad that you're connected with Ellen because I know that that is so critical, having someone to walk with you and walk things through. Uh, but yeah, the how to jumpstart your union has always been, you know, that's another Labor Notes publication, always been key to basics and how you build uh, we also have used Jay McAlevey's book on um, no shortcuts, and uh, that's another helpful thing. But but the labor notes is very easy to read. It really breaks things down, and and I just want to add that um, all these lovely women here, we've been connected through the struggle over over the past years, and we connect whenever we can. Uh, whether it's at a conference or at a meeting, uh, we're at different places across the nation, but we have this uh, movement going on, not only uh, the educational justice movement, but the, the relationship building that we're doing and learning from each other, sharing back best practices, come to the Labor Notes Conference. Uh, all of these are tools and you'll hear so much from other people that you can call for yourselves. Arlene, thank you. Um, I, I pitched it before, but Labor Notes Conference, you got to be there. April 17th is a, is a full day UCOR conference. Come on the night of the 16th. Uh, it will change your life. It will jet power uh, your caucus development. Amy Schramm says, I want to thank you for doing this uh, for us this evening. I feel that I, per that I feel that I personally this is something I'm wrapping my head around. Mm -hmm. I wanted to point out that the petition that we're trying to collect signatures with, it's in regard to a demand to reinstate the positions that were eliminated. Um, I remember hearing from Jillian that we should start with something simple. Is demanding this too soon? Anyone want to respond to that? Is it, is it premature to make demands to reinstate the hundred or so teachers that were laid off. No. 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 <laughs> no. no. <laughs> All right, I mean, next. <laughs> that's, that's what we're fighting for. How we right. get there, the ways we escalate to get there, how you're assessing your capacity to use your power. Those are things you need to be talking to each other about uh, within the context of what 
how far are you willing to go when? When will you strike? Um, but no. Those are your demands. Hold them I on. also, oh, I'm sorry, Barbara. I go ahead. Thank to you. I think um, like the reason that we picked the toxic schools issue for our petition is because it was hitting. Like it was, it was all over the newspaper. It was incredibly relevant to our entire union. Mm -hmm. Everybody in Philly was talking about it. And you win on issues that matter to people right now. It's like this very hard balance between like things that we want to organize around and things that our members want to organize around. And you have to like find, and it sounds like this is the thing that should be happening right now. And so you want to do the thing that's hitting. Um, and so I never, I never think it's too early to organize around something that really matters to people. And our unions need to be fighting for, I was talking about this with someone on the phone tonight, our unions have to fight for people's jobs. Mm. And we didn't have a caucus when PFT laid off 3,500 people in the summer of 2013 because of these draconian budget cuts. And if we had had a caucus, that would have been the thing. Like when you, when people are losing their jobs, that's what our unions have to be doing. And if your leadership's not doing it, then the rank and file's got to do it. So I feel like it's, it's like the perfect thing. And no demand is to, I'm, I'm learning over and over again, you do not get what you don't ask for. And so if you do not demand this thing, like there's no, there's no way you can win on it. So yeah, do it. It's like the right thing right now. Agree on that, Shira. Uh, there's a follow-up uh, from Michelle. Michelle, uh, Christina, Michelle says they want you to come with them when they meet with the president at their union on Friday. All right. So, <laughs> got it. You just it, take it'll a, be a, take it'll a be a short up. visit, and then you can go out afterwards. Keep that one. That, keep that meeting really short. Really yeah. short. Here's a question from Amy Schramm. We have a corrupted school board. I don't think anybody else here knows anything about that. Do you have any recommendations for how to approach them? Uh, for how the caucus can approach them? Christina, you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Who's got the most corrupt school board? No, I'm, I'm school. mostly thinking that it's very similar oh, to this okay. answer about right. the union leadership. That I, yeah, I mean, I, they can be, you can find un, unlikely people will come, and, come out and be your allies on specific fights. Our board is basically puppets of the CEO. Like, they're not going to, like, do much. But at the end of the day, like, you can you can win you can make a lot of wins even if you don't get something past the school board like if it builds the union if it builds the caucus if you start a fight stronger than oh sorry if you end a fight starter than if you end a fight stronger than you started it then you're better off and better prepared for the next fight um and it's not going to be like school board victories are like Oh, I I I don't trust. I don't, I don't think we're gonna get much beyond our school board just because they don't even conceptualize them, themselves as an oversight body. They don't think it's their job to say no to the CEO. Um, but every time we go up against them, we have a public opportunity to say who we are and what we believe, and that is that is something that that I consider a win. Excellent. Um, Barbara, I see your hands up, but we're getting almost to an hour and a half. Um, I don't know how much longer people have, so I thought maybe I'd quickly go through these these next questions if I can, and uh, then we can come back. Is that all right? Um, Kyle uh, Scavira says, as an untenured but vocal teacher, what suggestions do you have to galvanize younger union members to move through the sphere of participating in raw conversations? Any thoughts on how to embolden untenured educators? Anyone with um, wisdom for that? Go ahead, Barbara. I, I think it's really important to uh, respect that they are afraid, like not to try to tell them not to be afraid, but to give them opportunities to participate uh, where they're not quite right out front mm. right away um, and, and think about ways they can do that. And I, I don't think it's going to take much. Once you bring people in and they're 
experiencing acting together as part of a movement, they will then decide for themselves the decision to go back to Arlene's point about sort of like, where do you want to be in this? Like you have to give people the choice point. But I think if you can invite them in without asking them to do more than they're ready for and be conscious that you're giving them a place to come and talk and learn, um, they themselves will then know when they're ready to step over the line. Uh, but respect their, their anxiety about that. You bet. Uh, from Tracy Farmer, feeling your strength and your model that we are powerful when we come together. Thank you. From Mike Johnson, how frequently would you recommend that our caucus meet? What is a realistic expectation or should it happen organically? Oh my. <laughs> um, I don't think that's a question we will have time for here. I, I believe that people on this call would probably say, you have to feel your way. You have to decide like how far do people have to travel? Do you meet by phone? Do you meet in person? Do you have subcommittees? Um, I really take to heart Christina's suggestion before, which is get to know each other in the core group very well. You have got to form a really solid, loving, respectful, deep bond with one another um, in order to go through this work because the work is uh, hard uh, and it's long. And that's what's going to carry you through. Um, and the other questions, I think they, they do get answered. There is no formula for this. Uh, the caucuses all develop very, very differently. And the last question that I'm seeing, um, oh, here's another one though. We have many stakeholders encouraging visits to, oh my God, to Albany to talk to legislators and elected officials. Do you think that energy is well spent? Ladies, thumbs up or thumbs down? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question uh, from Christine Frederick. Panelists, do you think that due to national teacher shortage, the teachers' voices will have more power? And is that what the privateers are afraid of? Anyone have a response to that? Mary, go ahead. I think a circumstance alone is not enough to make people fear you, right? It's mm -hmm. the actions that mm -hmm. you take and the power that you develop by building your relationships that make people fear you. And, and they come to, they, when they come to understand your power, that's when they, and when they experience your power, that's when they become afraid of you. Well said, and it's a wonderful note for us to end on. It is, we are an hour and a half into the call. Um, I want to thank all the uh, Rochester participants. Uh, this was recorded. I should be able to get a link for you tomorrow. And um, I hope you can share it with others. Most importantly, I hope that there were some, uh, some things here, um, either at the level of the mind and the intellect or the heart and especially the hands, that is to say, to take action based on what you heard tonight. Uh, uh, Shira, Christina, Arlene, Mary, Barbara, I can't, um, I can't thank you enough. This was super visit, uh, valuable and as always, every time we get together and talk, uh, the wisdom just pours out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Roar comrades. Looking forward to our next time. And thank you, Ellen. Solidarity. Good luck, everybody. You too. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <clears throat>